joining us. We've got Tom Roloff in the house, and Tom is a Cube alum. We've had Tom on a number of times. Uh, he runs EMC's consulting business, senior vice president. Um, great perspectives that he has. And uh, we're going to talk about cloud, what people are doing in cloud, and, and how EMC is accelerating that. Come on in, Tom. Great to see you again. Oh, it was a pleasure. Yeah, so we have a clip of Tom. Uh, we'll roll which, after. We'll roll after. We'll right roll now we've got 2,000 okay, cool. people watching. I want to thank everybody out there for watching. Um, Love, love the audience when it comes in like that, Dave. It's like a wave, you know. Yeah, Thousands of people wave. come in from Justin TV and other places. Uh, thank you for watching. We're here at EMC World, uh, where tech innovation is happening uh, with EMC, the big muscle player here, and it's their show. We're independent, siliconangle.com, wikibon.org, covering it objectively. Um, it's a great event. Dave, I mean, you got a lot of big announcements. You know, the, the Hadoop announcements, which is going to have a lot of big impact to innovation. Uh, there's a lot of news out in the market today with PlayStation down, billions of dollars lost in value. Um, Amazon recently crashed. So there's a big message of services and, and new products. So Tom Roloff, uh, uh, thanks for coming on. That's Absolutely. your business. <laughs> another EMC World, another event. Another Let's see, event we saw you last you year at EMC World. We saw you at... Uh, at Oracle. At Oracle, that's right, yeah, that's right. It was yeah. good, and, uh, and probably two or three others, I don't know, I can't remember Great now. to see you both again, but, absolutely. Uh, yeah, pleasure, and so um, cloud meets big data, wow, okay, so last year we talked about sort of the journey to the private cloud, it was kind of new to people. People were saying, okay, well, yeah, that makes sense. Where are you in the journey? Well, I really haven't started yet, you know, right, but right. been busy. <laughs> yeah, it's true, it's true. So, um, so private so, cloud, is, is Dave, has been, you know, what's, what's been kind of there, okay, last year's theme, Hybrid cloud seems to be the buzzword everyone's talking about. And, yeah. and is that the intersection of the innovation and the reliable cloud? You know, I think it's a start. It's a start, to be honest, right? So I think the, uh, the private cloud story, like you said, it was, it was sort of a last year story, Dave, right? But, um, but I think it's, it's actually still a part of the story today, right? I think one of the things that we in the consulting space are spending a lot of time helping clients understand is, what actually goes where? You know, what part of your IT workload do you leave in a legacy environment? Uh, what part do you move into a private cloud? What part do you think about the public cloud for? And, and if you have some things operating in a public cloud environment, like most large CIOs do, and some things sitting in your, the own four walls of the data center, how do you bring those things together and make it a true hybrid cloud? So we spend a lot of time, in the conversation of cloud today for us with clients is not how do I build a private cloud or how do I take virtualization to private cloud, but rather how do I step back and take a top-down view at all the work I do in IT and decide what goes where. What workload do I put in the public cloud, in the private cloud, or leave in my legacy architecture? It's got to be top down too, doesn't it? If you try doing that as bottoms up, you get too confused, you boil the ocean, it takes forever, and you ultimately never get to the right answer. But, but, but there's a tendency in a lot of organizations to want to do a bottoms up, isn't there? Yeah. So how do you sort of reconcile that? And I know, you know there's, there's maybe money on the table, okay, we want to do this bottoms up, and you know it's going to fail. So how, yeah, yeah. how do you deal with that? You know, it's an interesting, uh, you know, I actually think that the right answer is for most enterprises to do a little bit of both, right? So if you take, uh, and even private cloud, frankly, private cloud was a bit of a bottoms up story, right? It was, we're going to help you virtualize a set of applications. We're going to start with your, the applications the CIO owns, right? And we're going to increment ourselves from IT owned apps into business critical apps, and ultimately we're going to create IT as a service for a set of applications that are in the four walls of the data center. That was a very left to right story, a very bottoms up kind of a story. Frankly, I think that story still has some traction in the enterprise. There are parts of the enterprise that, that do solve the problem in that direction. But what we find is that if that's all you're doing, you sometimes stall along the way. You, you don't actually get to really creating an IT as a service type of environment in, in your enterprise because there are some applications that, that don't belong in a private cloud, right? So when you combine a bottoms up uh, turbo virtualization strategy with a top down view that says to the CIO, hey, when was the last time you looked at your entire IT budget and turned it on the side and asked yourself, how much money can I save if I really took advantage of cloud in the extreme? And, and when we do that kind of exercise with clients, we, we help them think through, you know, is my, uh, is my CRM system better off at salesforce.com or better off in my own data center? Should, how should I be thinking about email to service providers from the cloud versus hosting exchange myself? that mainframe application that I'm running over there, should it stay on a mainframe or is there a way to actually take some modern architecture and, and, and do something with a mainframe application? So supplementing that left to right virtualization to private cloud story 
with a top-down view that says, I'm taking the entire IT budget, I'm going to figure out what do I put in public cloud, in private cloud, and in legacy IT, that, that tends to create a lot more momentum around the conversation of what, what goes where. So how should customers decide what goes in and, and actually more interestingly, what doesn't go into that private cloud? Yeah, so we, you know, we, we believe strongly that there are really three uh, conversations there. The first is the economics. Um, you know, the, the economics of uh, email in the public cloud is compelling, frankly, right? right? And you need to understand what those economics are and how that compares to the economics of keeping email in your own hosted environment. So filter one would be take a given workload, and by the way, if I take email, don't just talk about what does Exchange cost me. Talk about all the people that are managing the Exchange environments, that are managing the help desk, that are taking the you know, help desk calls around email, and look at the total cost of your email environment, and ask yourself what you're spending internally on email, compared to what you would be spending if you moved it over to a public cloud or, or created a hybrid cloud architecture. So filter one is the economic filter. Filter two is one that is getting a lot of play, and John, you alluded to it, right? The, the idea of trust and security is, I think, a big part of this conversation now. When people say, hey, the economics of Amazon are better than the economics of my internal you know, compute environment, um, that, that's a very real conversation, and you see the economics. But if you, it's not until something happens like what happened a few weeks ago that you ask yourself, hey, is the, is the public cloud environment or is the cloud environment I'm moving to actually trustworthy enough? Is it secure enough? And has the, has the enterprise really thought through exactly what the trust requirements are of me moving perhaps email? You know, if you're a manufacturing firm, you might feel one way about email. If you're a hospital, you might feel very differently about email. And the trust profile for what would have to be true of the public cloud environment for email in a hospital might be very different than the trust profile in a manufacturing firm. So after economics is a trust conversation. And the How third conversation, which is actually the easiest, is what's the functionality of the environment in the public cloud versus in my own four walls or in my own private cloud environment? And uh, you know, that's one where familiarity with all the different offerings in the hybrid cloud is an important alternative. We bring a lot of that capability to a CIO and we'll tell them a little bit about here's what BPOS is doing with Exchange, here's what Verizon's doing with Exchange, you know, here's what you could do yourself with Exchange. And, and so we can help you understand some of the different functionality differences between the alternatives as well. That's a great framework, I like that. Economics, the trust factor, and the functionality right. in, the, in the cloud versus in those. And on the second one, on the trust, we talk a lot about security. Um, you heard Joe talk about it. We, you know, it's, of course, it's the, one of the evil twins of the cloud. Um, I don't know if we're getting any safer. It's the bad guys are out there. I almost feel like it's you know, living in the country of Israel, the state of Israel, because you know, there's, there's, there's risks going on, but it's a, it's a capitalist society, they're growing, it's a, it's a you know, safe environment. Sure. Every now and then some big profile thing happens and I kind of feel like the cloud is the same way. The, the rewards outweigh the risks. But like my specific question is, are you seeing privacy become more uh, of an issue? You're seeing Facebook and Google, you know, Android and Apple yeah. tracking us on yeah. everywhere we go. Are CIOs thinking about privacy yet? So I think they should be. Uh, and by the way, I think, I think the ones that are thinking hard about cloud are, because you're exactly right, it gets brought up in the context of cloud. If I'm moving information somewhere outside of my four walls, how do I know that, I've, it's, that it's protecting the privacy of the individual, right? And some industries, by the way, care a lot more about that than others. Banks care a lot about it. Healthcare cares a lot about it. You know, so the heightened focus on certain regulated industries and what that means for the, uh, the governance, risk, and compliance element of managing information and what that means for identity is, is a very big part of, I think, the your cloud uh, conversation. So when we, send, when we spend time in that middle part of the framework, as you were saying, right, the trust part, we're spending a lot of time with a CIO and with the organization saying, what would have to be true about the cloud environment that you're either building or maybe the public cloud environment you want to move to in order for you to be compliant with all the regulatory things that are per pertinent to your business, with all the policies you have about how you manage information, and frankly with the types of risk profile that, that you may have to take on in, in whatever uh, part of the uh, cloud spectrum you want to put a certain workload. Tom, uh, it's a very big part of the conversation, to be honest with you. Tom, um, businesses in IT have always thought of the cloud as ad agile, and being fast and being nimble, um, from put the credit card down, get some test and development operations out in the cloud. Um, so cloud is enticing, it's intoxicating to the IT guy, because it's like, hey, I can reduce costs in one shot, move everything to the cloud, which is, it is intoxicating. You could be drunk and then have a PlayStation situation um, or an Amazon.com situation. But you're talking about complex IT. And so that's 
Accenture, EMC Consulting, Ecosystem Partnerships, IT has to spend some dough to get that done. Yep. Um, so that's great, we kind of get that. But now when you start throwing in cloud meets big data, that's an interesting dynamic because there's a lot of sizzle involved in that. Um, so where's the stake on this? Like, how does that impact IT budget from your standpoint? Because you got to go deploy this stuff. So yeah. can you talk about specifically how IT meets big data, yeah. IT meets cloud and big data? Yeah, so you know, I think it's another one of the, frankly, the success factors of thinking about a cloud strategy is not just you know, what goes where and how much money can I save? And the savings are very substantial, right? We do cloud strategies for clients. We find 20, 25% savings in IT budgets in a future state cloud architecture that leverages public, private, and hybrid cloud, right? So there's a lot of money on the table. But the, the issue, if we make cloud a story only about saving money, frankly, the CIO becomes interested, but we're, we're failing to answer the real need of what cloud can do for the enterprise, which is create the kind of agility that, that the business user is really after, right? So the idea that, that we're saving a ton of money and we should figure out what we're going to do with those savings ahead of time is, is really, to me, where the intersection between cloud and big data comes in because we're creating a massive business case for the enterprise on saving dollars, we need to give, we need to help the CIO answer the question of what is that savings going to do for the enterprise? If all it does is hit the bottom line and we give it back to the CIO, we've done something. But frankly, the CIO has been getting really beaten up for, for many years now of saying, you're not agile enough. Your enterprise, you know, your IT organization is uh, too unwieldy. It takes you too long to do certain things. We need to help the CIO articulate how cloud is going to free up capital to allow him to create the business agility that frankly his business users really want from him. And so I think a very big part of, of making cloud successful and of where cloud and big data intersect is to create the revenue stream implications of cloud savings. So for example, uh, you know, if, if we're helping a client uh, consolidate data centers and come up with, uh, you know, what's the private cloud and what's the public cloud, and we're putting a couple hundred million dollars on the table, and we're not helping them think through how a hundred million dollars can help them accelerate certain IT projects they've deferred for a while, then, then we're not helping enough. And if we're not getting to the point of saying, here's a bunch of uh, initiatives that the, that the uh, business users of your enterprise really want. You know, it's a bank, and they really need to understand a 360 degree view of a customer. If we're not using cloud savings to help articulate how we can redeploy that saving uh, into the analytics that the business really needs, then I think we're only answering half the equation for uh, the CIO. And then, and then to, by inference, uh, the next step is, okay, how do you monetize th that data, for example? Right. Um, you know, there's the theory out there, and, and I first heard this from uh, Tim O'Reilly, the, the, the media publisher, he said, I've looked at, this is Tim speaking, open source software, and, and the way it's commoditizing traditional software. And it dawned on Tim that the next source of competitive advantage in the IT industry is going to be data and information, and how you package information and ultimately monetize that. Are you? Are you seeing those discussions directly in oh, yeah. the customer base? And, yeah, yeah. And, and can you share any sort of examples or? Well, you know, so I'm, uh, trust me, I'm extremely excited about yeah. the fact that the industry as a whole is talking about analytics and that I'm part of a company that is really embracing uh, the fact that, that the ultimate value of IT is creating a seamless way to get information in the hands of a business user, right? So, I mean, if we step way back, right? creating big data centers and housing big complicated IT infrastructure and maybe even creating applications, those are just means to an end. The end at the end of the day is to affect decision making of a business user. And you know, if, if the IT organization is just a big set of data that's very complicated to, to navigate through, then, then we get the reputation in IT perhaps of not being agile enough for the enterprise. The promise to me of cloud architectures and of analytics is that we can create very fluid information architectures and we can get that information out of the silos that it sits in today and put it on the desktop of a business user and have it be something that affects a decision today. You know, we can, we can swipe a credit card and have that information be informed by uh, you know, whether, whether we should approve or deny that, uh, that interaction can be informed by all the other transactions that that user has made with that credit card in a real-time way. I think if we get to the point where analytics are, are that real-time and interfa interacting with the transaction processing in a real-time way, 
Now we're starting to create the real promise of what we have IT for, which is to help us make better decisions by business users in real time. Do you think the business users will wait for IT? I mean, you remember the whole <laughs> distributed computing and right. the, the client server thing, and in many ways that was a failure, right? Because we did it, we spent like crazy, and then finally, CEOs said, wait a minute, I think we got to bring this back in. You know, IT, we've been pounding on you for 10 years as, you know, too slow, too old, too whatever. Now, please, take it over and fix this mess. Are we going to see something similar in, 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 in data science and big data, or have we learned our lesson? Well, so I think that's the tension that we're living in, right? I think, uh, I think frankly, a lot of business users aren't asking IT about whether they want to use Amazon or use the public cloud, just right? They're just it. getting right. it done. Right. And, uh, and you know, I think part of what you're starting to see is some of those experiments and seeing maybe the dark side of some of those experiments, right? Because if you do allow that to go completely amok without any adult supervision, you're going to wind up in a place where the business is at risk, right? So back to the trust concept of you know, what the, the central part of cloud strategies and how trustworthy is that cloud environment that you're building. I think there is a tension there between uh, allowing a business user to make a decision that is optimal for their business at that moment and doing it in a way that is secure and trustworthy in the long term. And I think what, we're, what we have to do for CIOs is to help them balance that. And frankly, I think what, one of the things EMC Consulting is trying to do is help people balance exactly that tension. Well, I wanted to ask you about that. I mean, EMC Consulting is like this, this really powerful lever in the organization. It's not you know, a, a giant you know, portion of the revenues, but it's a very important component. Uh, now, of course, EMC's marketing is fantastic. We see it every year at EMC World. You, you put forth these visions of cloud and, and, and big data. Um, and you guys in EMC Consulting are, are largely a catalyst for some of those initiatives. At the same time, you have to be independent for the customer. So how do you manage that natural tension? You know, I think, uh, I think EMC is learning that, that, uh, that we can help with the, the business-facing side of the equation, right? If, uh, I think if the customer is expecting EMC Consulting to help them make a decision about whether they should use EMC storage or some competitor's storage, um, they quickly find out that that's not the capability of EMC Consulting, right? There are really strong parts of EMC that can help articulate the value proposition of all of our products. But, um, but if the customer is interested in information management challenge, that frankly is independent of technology, right? If it's a question about how do I get a 360 degree view of a customer in a bank, right? If that's the kind of problem we're trying to solve, that has ultimately a lot to do with technology, but not initially. The, the initial business problem is one that has to be articulated and framed and, and, and somewhat solved before we make decisions about technology. And I think that's one of the things that EMC Consulting brings to the conversation is maybe an understanding of the depths of the technology architecture, but, but not necessarily a bias to saying it's got to be solved one way or the other. We're, we're really starting with the business problem and, and allowing the technology to fold into that problem after the fact. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, you talk about that, that 360 degree view. You talk to a lot of CIOs and CEOs. Um, I think the lot, a lot of times the problem is just recognition that this is a priority. I mean, take that, take customer service in general. I mean, we all have customer service stories, right? You call the cable company or the airline or whatever it is and you get put on hold and you're frustrated, you're routed to the wrong person a million times and you just wonder, do they not realize right. that you know, they're going to lose business over this? And so a lot of times, you're right, it's not a technology problem, it's a prioritization problem. Exactly. Isn't it? And, and now, do you help with that? Yeah. How do you help with that? Do you, do you, specifically as it relates to, to customer service, that 360 degree, is there hope? Oh, absolutely, <laughs> right? So this is, I mean, contact centers are an interesting, yeah. you know, I mean, I think we've done a lot in contact center technology, right? We've, we've come up with ways to route calls more efficiently. We've come up with ways to uh, create pop-up screens for the attendant that is taking the call to make sure that he's got a certain set of information in front of him. But, but unfortunately, behind all of that is still a very siloed information architecture. It's still very difficult for the person that is calling up your account, right, to know exactly what you bought, when you bought it, what version of a certain uh, product you might be on, uh, you know, when was the last time you called and what are the things that happen in there, and, and maybe even some of the intangible things. How current is your account? Uh, you know, have we had an outage in your geographic area at some point in some way? Um, you know, bringing all of those different islands of information together requires an information architecture, which frankly, too few companies have, even in, I mean, in something as rudimentary as contact center spaces, right? So we do spend a lot of time with saying, hey, look, here's how you're looking at a contact center problem today. This is the information you're rendering to the person that's taking the call. Here's the information you're not rendering. And, and how do we bring that information to bear as well? And how do we prioritize what's most relevant about that and figure out a data architecture that allows you to bring all of that information to the fore very, very quickly. And, and, and but frankly, 
one of the other things then is, what does that screen look like that the person is looking at, right? How do you quickly navigate through that and say, oh, this person wants to know about you know, an add-on sale. Let me quickly be able to talk about that in some yes. way. So you're talking about empowering that agent, for example. And that's not, that's not something people generally think about EMC as uh, having a core competency, but that's really what EMC Consulting, as an example, might do, right? Yeah, and I, mean, I would say to you, by the way, that EMC Technologies are increasingly able to answer the technology problem underneath that, right? What EMC Consulting brings to that is really starting with the business problem and saying, let me solve the business problem. That'll create a conversation about, uh, about technology architectures. And, and you know, those are actually relevant to EMC. And EMC, I think, wants to help. The rest of EMC wants to help with that kind of conversation. So Grainplum plus Isilon plus you know, Documentum coming together to go handle some of these, these siloed information architectures and bring them together as one architecture, that's a technology point of view that EMC will bring to the conversation. Frankly, EMC Consulting is more worried about what is the business problem we can go solve, and uh, you know, if, if the EMC technology can help solve that problem, um, then, then we can definitely introduce the rest of EMC into that equation, but I, but I hope that we are maybe better positioned to answer the business problem because we understand some of the underlying technology issues underneath that. Yeah, interesting role. We're here with Tom Roloff, Senior Vice President of EMC Consulting, talking about what EMC Consulting does. About a lot of people may not know, but uh, EMC has a, a, a thriving consulting business and uh, very strategic. Um, and I think it's a, a, a key piece of EMC because generally EMC sells directly to the IT people, right? A lot of times those guys aren't the final decision right. makers. So uh, EMC Consulting sells more to the line of business, CIOs, and, and more senior executives. So we're seeing you know, right in front of us the transformation of EMC from a storage company to more of an enterprise supplier, um, a company with a 50 plus billion dollar market cap, and, uh, and uh, it's great to see this transformation and be part of it. So Tom Roloff, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. Thanks, Always thanks. a pleasure. Appreciate it. Good to see you. Thank you very Good much. You. Hey, Tom.